It's Thursday. Oh, my voice cracked there. Sorry. Let's try that again. It's Thursday, and you know what that means. It's time to ignite the day after dynamite. Welcome to Day After Dynamite. I'm Will Washington, but I'm not alone here. I'm also joined by another one of my favorite dads in this wrestling community. It's Mr. SP3. Glad, glad to be here with Will Washington. I've been waiting for this moment where I can share the screen with one of the OGs of this wrestling podcast game. And he and, and I say OG very, very uh, at the side of my mouth because he's the same age as me. But I, I enjoy your work so much. And I'm very happy to be here on the draw of Fightful Overbooked. I'm on a few shows on this channel that doesn't even combine the amount of views that this show does because this man knows what he's doing ladies and gentlemen but, but thank you i appreciate that and uh i don't know I, I i the thing is i've been wanting you on this show for a while because i feel like you're killing it i think content you you just bring so much content to the world that uh i don't know i think I'm in this mode where I like almost want to start checking out Degrassi because my wife is like, uh, she's such. My wife is obsessed with Degrassi, right? She like so. Uh, when I told her that, um, well, we were just talking the other day because uh, Degrassi is coming to HBO Max, yes. and so uh, she has been wanting to bring it to my attention. Like this, is how long my wife and I have been together? Um, when Drake first hit the scene, uh, she was like. Oh, and she was like excited about it because she's like, I can't wait. I know his whole career. And I'm like, really? Like, she was like, yeah, he was on Degrassi, the next generation. And I'm like, what the hell are you talking about? And uh, and then she like Googled it, showed me images. And I'm like, oh, OK, that's how long we've been together, by the way. <laughs> um, but <laughs> uh, So either way, you know, you've, you've got so much content that you've got out there. And I love that you have this ability to just kind of use your knowledge about all the things that you're into and just kind of like just talk about it and it's always great i love sp3 and i'm so happy to have him here on day after dynamite right here on fightful overbooked and don't forget to send us uh your messages uh your super chats um we always appreciate those those help keep fightful overbooked afloat and help us continue to do what we do uh we got one from ricardo the bad guy says love for the true heel phenom sp3 thank you ricardo thank you ricardo appreciate the love appreciate the super chat and you don't know how much you just popped me by telling me that your wife is a degrassi fan because i was that dude who was in like high school and drake was dropping up like man that's wheelchair jimmy that's Jimmy yeah. Brooks. Like that. <laughs> I, I, y'all want me to take him serious, and then he started rapping on the show, and I was like, okay, he's he's all right. So that was what yeah. she informed me of. She was yeah. like, so he rapped on the show, and I was like, nah, come on, I don't. <laughs> what? That doesn't even. That sounds like a made up fact. That don't even sound real. And nah, I mean that that was Aubrey Graham, um, and. <laughs> So that, that's just funny to me. Uh, yeah, so we're talking last night's AEW Dynamite episode. Uh, it took place live from the HEB Center in Cedar Park, Texas, right outside of Austin. Um, previous episodes that took place here, off the top of my head, we have the February 12th, 2020 edition of Dynamite, a uh, show that saw, hold on, that, I'm pretty sure I've got that card memorized. Um, we think that show started with a tag title match, uh, Kenny and Hangman defended against SCU, I remember that. Uh, what else was on that show? That was the show that Nyla Rose won the, um... The, woman's yeah, the women's title. She beat Riho. One uh, of the, the best women's matches that they've had in, in Dynamite history. Yes. Agreed. Uh, the main event was the eye for an eye match. That was Santana versus Moxley. And elsewhere on the card, Jungle Boy faced uh, MJF. And... Uh, what else would have been on the show? I guess it doesn't matter. That's a lot from that show. Man, I, I I love your knowledge. Like, you're, <laughs> you are you are one of the rare people that I, I can share. I love that you just could off the top of your dome know the date and know all the matches. On so I, I was thing. so I said a couple of weeks ago that like uh, I was telling uh, Cher that my memory of 
pro wrestling has a lot to do with locations. I'm really good about associating locations with what happened there. So the only stuff that I'm like really scrambled about is all the dailies place stuff because like that all took yeah. place in the same place and it's all just it all runs together. And so I don't have this great memory of things that took place there like i can remember what took place but not necessarily when but you tell me oh there's a show in atlanta georgia and i'm like oh yeah i know exactly what took place in atlanta georgia because i can associate the the crowds and all of that um like the uh, the other show that took place at this very arena was fighter fest night one back in july of last year and that saw um john moxley defending the uh IWGP United States yeah. Championship against Carl Anderson. Main event was the uh, the coffin match between Darby, Darby and, and Ethan, Ethan Page. Page. Yeah, so uh, lots of stuff that's that's taking place uh, across these shows. But we're back here. And the reason I want to talk about this arena is because uh, this has always been a surprisingly hot crowd. Um, they are such a phenomenal crowd for AEW. Um, the Texas crowds in general have always been good to them, but uh, but Austin has really been one of those surprisers because I remember th- walking away from that uh, the episode back in 2020, thinking that was one of the best episodes they had done of Dynamite up to that point. And oh yeah, Jeff Cobb debuted on that show too. Um, that, that whole <laughs> month, I, I remember. I I don't remember match for match, but I remember like what was the best match each week because I know the mm-hmm. week before that was I believe Cody and Wardlow in the cage. That was the then week after. The oh the week after. So yeah, yeah that, that was the week after. Then that was the that was the same show that had uh, Hangman Page and Kenny Omega versus the, versus Lucha, the Bros, Lucha Bros, which is the most underappreciated tag team matchup in AEW history. It's I love a that phenomenal match. Phenomenal TV but, match. It gets overshadowed by Cody and Warlow on the same show. And then the following week was the Iron Man match with Pac and Omega, which is top five dynamite match of all time. So yeah, I, I just remember that whole month is like the in my opinion, probably in the top two best months of dynamite in history. Oh yeah. February twenty twenty was a uh uh just a phenomenal month and it is really a shame that uh literally a month later it was like because it was like, oh, we got so much big stuff coming, and then it was like, nope, we're done. Uh, so, <laughs> uh, what a great time, though. But yeah, uh, I I was really anticipating this because San Antonio was a great crowd for them last week too. Uh, but Austin really came through here, um, practically sold out the show. There were maybe a handful of seats still left, but practically sold it out. And yeah, it they were ready to go from the opening bell and we got an announcement late in the day for what was going to open the show and that turned out to be as i bring up my graphic here cm punk one-on-one with dax harwood of course the image has him accompanied by uh cash wheeler that didn't quite happen um (laughs) but i guess it did he eventually came out but he he let Dax do his own devices. Um, I'm a big fan of singles match Dax Harwood. I didn't know I would be until the Jungle Boy match. But yep. after that, I was like, I just want to see Dax have singles matches. Nothing against Cash Wheeler. But this guy has it as a singles wrestler. And so when this got announced uh, whenever dax harwood versus anybody gets announced you know he had the match with pack back in uh uh yeah back it was that september november is that november um yeah Yeah, yeah because i was going into full gear yeah uh uh, i love that match though um and i just love seeing dax harwood in singles competition of course these two guys are both big bret hart fans i'm also a big bret hart fan um same here you know the the silly thing though is that I know because I've been podcasting for seventeen years and everything I've ever done is out there. I recognize that somebody's gonna pull up some old quote of me saying Shawn Michaels was better than Bret Hart because I know that at one point I used to say that. But you know what? Maturity. 
over time. <laughs> yes, exactly. Like I was the same way when I was like a young man. I would have, I like at WrestleMania 12, I was rooting for Shawn Michaels over mm-hmm. Brett the Hitman Hart for sure. But as time has went on, you get to appreciate just the, 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 the little things that Bret Hart did so well. And as you get older, you, you just learn that Brett is the excellence of execution for a reason. And yeah, he's the one I prefer now over Sean. Oh yeah, same. I, I I say it's the biggest sign of maturity when somebody can admit that Brett was better, uh, and when somebody says no, 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 it's it's definitely Sean. I'm like, oh, you'll mature one day. But um, <laughs> uh, I mean, because honestly, I didn't become a Brett Hart guy until the network era. Uh, because mm. honestly, it was in going back and watching a lot of Bret Hart stuff that I realized that like the what I pr- want in wrestling today is more of what Bret Hart brought to the table, and yeah. so um, like I I just I matured into a Bret Hart guy, uh, and <laughs> so sorry I, I I was a Shawn Michaels guy growing up I very much was, uh, but I'm a Bret guy now. And so knowing that these two are both big Brett guys, I was thinking about immediately, okay, I know what they're planning in this match. They're both planning on bringing a little Brett to the table. Um, somebody had even noticed that it was the uh, the 25th anniversary of Brett versus Austin, Austin. at WrestleMania. And they were the in Austin. The Mania match. Just want to say that. That's yes. the Goat Mania match. It is. And they were in Austin, Texas. So it was like... 25th anniversary of Brett Austin in Austin with two Brett fans. Like, it is poetic here. And uh, so that was the match we got. Uh, Brett Hart, or not Brett Hart, um, CM Punk versus Dax Harwood. Uh, might as well have been, though. Because um, they both they both went to do a Brett Hart-style match. You could very much feel that all throughout this match, um, including Dax's use of the sharpshooter. Uh and I don't know what you think of the match. Oh, I love this match. This was just brilliant. And and Dax pretty much did the Bret Hart working over the back offense in this matchup. He did the backbreaker. Uh, he did the old, the old school because a lot of people don't don't remember when he was feuding with Dynamite Kid back in the Canadian Stampede days. He also tried to use that flying headbutt, which I never advise anybody to use because it has long term damage. But <laughs> Dax did it in the best way possible. I, I love Dax in these matches. Matches. totally agree with you any Dax Hardwood singles match just stands out that was the first time that I thought Jungle Boy was like a single star that can rise to the top was against Dax the the pack match was hard hitting and then this was just something different where they really had like a technical wrestling clinic you had the the strike exchange you had Dax with the big superplex off the top rope you had the suplex to the outside then you kind of had the organic where you heard the crowd that booed Dax when he made his entrance kind of get on his side when in that second half mm-hmm. of that match especially when cash comes out and starts rallying behind him and he reverses the go to sleep into the sharpshooter the crowd was so behind him and i love just hearing the crowd kind of change and switch over like that like there was so much to love about this match and cm punk winning just made the whole bunch of sense love what they did with the post match too with ftr usually would you know attack somebody or be bitter about a loss no they just took it on the chin they were more upset with the gun club, uh, the ass boys talking their smack more than they were with the loss here. So I dig it. So a lot of what you pointed out there felt by design to me because I, I yeah. felt like, like as the match progressed, Dax was working more of a baby face. Not, not in a way where like Punk was working heel, but in a way where it felt like two guys who just wanted to win more so than Dax working heel. And it felt like, you know, the last couple of weeks, it felt like the FTR was was head. Headed toward a babyface turn. It feels like uh, um, I'm pretty sure their contracts are up in like two months. So if there's ever a time to get one more Young Bucks match out, this is the time to do it. And it felt like they were planting the seeds last week. Uh, so that's that's kind of where I feel like they're going with this. Because uh, what they did you the night after or the Wednesday after Double or Nothing, the second one. So yeah. if they sign two year deals. Double or nothing is pretty much what you've got left with him, unless you can get him to resign. Uh, and so, if that's the case, like we got to get that second bucks 
smash out. And I think you're for, you're going in and out a little bit. I think you're yeah. like they're sounding robotic a little bit. Oh. <laughs> hmm. I don't know what's going on. Interesting. Tell me <laughs> if that fixes, because if you hear it that way, then likely. Yeah, I think I think uh, Joel just pointed out in the live chat the mic is acting up. You may want to like un unplug, plug it back in, maybe. The problem is I hear myself just fine in the headphones, so it's got to be a connection thing. So oh, that is no good. I know it did this last <laughs> week. Somebody pointed out to me. Uh, Will your connection is wonky? Mike is acting up. Uh, this is great. Do you hear it that way? Uh, you sound good now. Okay, well, I sound fine now. Yeah. Yes. Well, okay. Good. I like hear one part of you, and then I don't. It's like I don't know. I think. I think. <sighs> I think. Okay, Joel said you're good now, so you're good. <laughs> okay, I, I I hope so. Okay, so where I was going with this, uh, I don't even know what people didn't hear, uh, but <laughs> uh, the. Where was I even going with this? Oh, FTR. They're trying to babyface. Very clearly. Yeah. Uh, I think there needs to be a moment, of course, where it's solidified. And I think uh, that probably happens, my guess is, next week uh, against... Because, uh, you know, they, they we'll talk about what they did with the Pinnacle stuff later on. Um, but, yeah, it felt like Dax was working the match all throughout uh, to kind of garner a little bit more baby face sympathy and then as the match went on uh he came out of it in a way where it felt like the fans were supposed to feel like he gave a valiant effort and of course then you had the gun club at ringside who also seemed like they were there to antagonize ftr and uh get us toward ftr's first uh baby face action since they debuted because they debuted at uh as baby faces uh, and then yeah. turned heel uh, on when they attacked the Rock and Roll Express. Um, but <laughs> a lot of people forget how we got here. But, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but they they've been uh, they've been heels since then. That was right before All Out 2020, and now here we are. Uh, so I like this. I liked everything about it. I even liked the fact that uh, like I don't even think commentary picked up on what. CM Punk was doing when he yeah. when he did the whole like mo shit yeah and uh it, right and then Excalibur's like uh oh well CM Punk of course uh, referencing the dog collar match I'm like I think that was supposed to be a hangman exactly uh, <laughs> the dog collar is already around your neck there's no need to do all right. of that it's the hanging motion and yeah. then he gets up and he's pointing at his chest doing the the title belt signal so it makes a whole world of sense to do this. I, I have been under the belief for months that it should be Hangman Page versus MJF at Double or Nothing for the AEW World Championship. But with the fact that they've had their li their highest grossing live gate of all time at Double or Nothing already with 13,000 tickets sold, 1 million uh, grossing already, they need this big money type of main event. And Hangman Adam Page versus CM Punk that fits the bill a little bit more than MJF and and uh, Hangman Page. But MJF's promo, which we'll talk about, kind of tease where I think they're going after Double or Nothing. Yeah, there's there's a lot you can do there. So honestly, yeah, go with it. CM yeah. Punk versus Hangman Adam Page. I was the same way. I was like, yeah, do the MJF match. But honestly, nah, go there. See, <laughs> Punk is still the hottest baby face you have. You might as well strike with him while it's hot. Uh, it would actually make sense. Um, and it does feel like they're also getting CM Punk some singles victories to justify it. Uh, he hasn't even been ranked yet. And once we start ranking him, he moves up. I think we are going with CM Punk versus uh, Hangman Adam Page at Double or Nothing for the AEW Championship. And you know what's funny? either victory works like on one side of it it's like yeah obviously punk is here to put over the younger talent uh let's give hangman adam page his victory but on the other hand cm punk's also the hottest baby face they have how yeah. nice would it be to have cm punk with those massive reactions coming out to cult of personality and getting to point to the championship just one more time like that also sounds great too <laughs> <laughs> 
<laughs> so and the next pay per view after that, Chicago, like have Punk walk into Chicago as champ. That also sounds dope. So I don't know. I I would actually like to see that. I feel like because um, Ace in the chat says that you know Punk has to get through Cole, and I thought, ah, does he? Uh, I'm pretty sure Cole and Hangman's happening at Battle of yeah. the Belts, and so you do if they're doing that at Battle of the Belts, then it doesn't matter. Yes, Cole Cole <laughs> has his his one wing angel that's waiting in the in the in the wings when he gets all healthy uh, to verse <laughs> down the line. That's the big money match for Cole. But Paige needs like this uh, kind of a bigger challenge. Like Adam Cole mm-hmm. was a great challenger, and they had a fantastic main event at Revolution. But CM Punk, I feel like this is Punk's bag where he could still be a baby face, but he's the cocky baby face that's looking down on his opponent, similar to what he did with Eddie Kingston, where he can look at Hangman. Adam Page and he can be like you know you're young you're great you won the AEW world championship but you needed alcohol to do it and I never needed that so <laughs> oh, man, that would just be the great char- the character work is just fantastic there there's so much potential to go there I just love that idea and I think that it, yeah that's the match to go with that just feels like a big time main event for AEW I agree I also see Jeremy who's popped in on us. And... I was waiting for you to just like put me on screen. Like, yeah. I came, I was like, I was like, you in. have the ability to do that. I so. know, but like, I wasn't gonna interrupt SV3, so yeah. I wasn't gonna do that. I like uh, popping in when you have uh, people that I, I know that I'm friends with, and SV3 does more shows on this channel than I do. So I mean, yeah. he, he basically runs this channel. Over me at this point. <laughs> We got we got three dads, man. You you. I know, you're right? Like, like, like Will, you you need to watch FMC because I'm giving I mean, we're giving Jeremy dad training. So we need you to come on FMC because Jeremy is able to to talk about the dad life he's living. I'm able to talk about my two year old twins. I know you got the older kids, Will. So you you the vet of I, of a I, I have my kids young. I know. <laughs> <laughs> I got a kid going into middle school in oh, a couple man. of months. Oh, the tears. Like, like, <laughs> I can't. I can't give the age of of, of the kids. EP EP won't uh, appreciate that. But yeah, one one of them's a little bit older-ish. Um, but yeah, I I need help. I need I need help. It's been it's been four months now, and I need I need some some advice from everybody. We're gonna do the dad roundtable. Us three and McCarthy yes. at some point. Uh-huh. Oh, yeah. oh hell yeah! We're gonna do the dad roundtable. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, people, A Shock wasn't know my, my take on disowned Uncle Dan. Man, that segment was cringeworthy yeah, last night. <laughs> I mean, shout out to Sammy Guevara and Ty Conti. They're having a lot of sex. Good on them, right? <laughs> That's that was my I, take away. Okay, I want people to actually be able to see Jeremy. <laughs> no, I like the little split, the split screen. <laughs> yeah. They're they're having a lot of sex, you know. They're having a healthy healthy relationship with that. Good on good on them, I guess. Yes. <laughs> I take no ownership of Dan Lambert. All right, he's not even the worst thing about this uh, feud, though. I will say that. I will say that. Yeah. Nope. 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 Like, and I, and I really like. I was going to wait till we got to it, but this show was like a ten out of ten all timer for an hour and twenty minutes, and then that segment happened. And I don't know where it kind of veered left. They kind of got back to some quality in the main event, but they kind of veered left on that segment <laughs> for the yeah. entire show. That I'll I'll let you guys talk about it. But that and then the way they did Thunder Rosa, which was which was not. Yeah. Good. I know that's in the yeah. the headline here, but cool. Another person wins a title, and here's Nyla Rose to feud with her. <laughs> like what what are we what are we doing here? I just popped on to say hi because SB3 SB3 is my dude, and we're gonna be on a uh, FMC tomorrow. And again, he he runs this channel, so shout out to SB3 who, who runs this channel. And shout out to Will, Will, great man, guys. Appreciate y'all. I'll talk to y'all later on. Enjoy the show, everyone. Hi, everyone. Bye, everyone. <laughs> Love Jeremy. <laughs> Love Jeremy. <laughs> Love the Jeremy pop into our day after dynamite. So, next match here. Uh, so we had a backstage segment with um, Jericho Appreciation Society. Uh, I feel like I didn't, I wasn't sure at first, but just watching this segment, I think this is gonna end up being what 
uh, Daniel Garcia has needed. And, uh, you know, say what you will about Chris Jericho. You got Sammy Guevara very over. And yes. I'm already watching what this is kind of doing for uh, Daniel Garcia. I think he's going to walk away from this quite well. And uh, just a little bit of mic time he got here. Very good. Um, I also do think that 2.0 is going to get very over out of this. Uh, this is this is good stuff, actually. I'm kind of surprised I'm liking uh, the Jericho Appreciation Society as much as I uh, as I am. I mean, I do still think it's kind of silly that uh, you have basically the same formation as the Inner Circle and you have a tag team called 2.0 and you didn't just call it Inner Circle 2.0. But whatever. Yeah. Yeah, I, I totally agree with you. The name was just there for you to take, but 100% agree with you on Daniel Garcia. This is a vehicle to get Daniel Garcia over, and he's been someone that they have given a lot of opportunities to, so you could tell that they are see big things in him, but having Jericho there, that's going to get him the character work he needs, the mic work he needs. He's already uh, amazing in the ring. He just needs the other things to become a complete sports entertainer so that's yes. <laughs> what this is all a vehicle to accomplish and the number one thing about this entire segment that i enjoyed it hyped the main event and that's something that i think dynamite lacks a lot is just mike is either promo work or like video packages to make the main event feel important so like last week that was my biggest nitpick on the entire show i thought the show was amazing but my biggest nitpick is that thunder rosa Britt baker they have a year-long rivalry where's the video package give me 30 seconds just covering how we got to this point before we get to the main event and it makes it feel bigger and just having the promo segment here was nice okay i have an idea um because I think they used to do this in the early days of Dynamite. Yes. And I think they should bring it back. Um, but I would take a minute. And you know you got the video production crew for that. But I would take a, take a minute. You're, of course you did. I'm not even going to have to ask. But you watched X-Men growing up, right? Oh. Um, so you remember previously on X-Men. Yes. So I would love... But remember, it wasn't just what happened in the last episode. It was what's relevant... To today's episode. episode, yes. <laughs> and so, because sometimes, you know, it's whatever happened previously that's relevant to this show. I think they should take 60 seconds at the start of the show, uh, which is like a previously on Dynamite, and just a quick 60 seconds of what is relevant to this episode. You know who's also good about that? This Is Us. I watch a lot of This Is Us. This I, I I was going to bring up Power. Power does that every episode. Mm -hmm. They don't yes. sh or necessarily show you all the things that happened the week before, but they show you all the things you need to remember for this episode here. So that would have been nice on this one. Yeah, and I think I think just that would go a long way, especially with people coming straight out of Big Bang Theory who might just be catching this. I think that is something that you could do for this crowd, uh, or for that crowd. It's like, okay, here's everything you need to know going into this show. Quick 60 seconds. Um because really that's just trimming 10 seconds off of each segment. And then you use 60 seconds to tell people what's going into Dynamite. Like you already trimmed the theme song down to 15 seconds and that makes me really sad. Um, but <laughs> uh, so I think just taking a minute previously on Dynamite, here's what you need to know, starting the show. And that's it. Uh, Monique, uh, finally catching a live dad and showing some love. Thank you, Monique. Uh, Dynamite was a 7.5 out of 10 for me fell off a bit at the end um i have a slight disagreement with that statement because a lot of people have been saying it. i i feel like you haven't as a matter of fact um sp3 gave exactly how i felt about it uh which is i thought that the main event picked it up whereas i feel like a lot of people were down on the main event uh but let's keep going because we had a gosh dang hoot <laughs> but we had Eight-man tornado tag. I wasn't sure I was even going to feel about this being a tornado tag so soon after the six-man tornado tag we had at Revolution. But, and with a lot of the same guys. Yes. Uh, so, as a matter of fact, uh, only one member of the other match wasn't in this one. And that's Sammy <laughs> Guevara. But, uh, and, but at least Matt's on the other side of it this time. I wasn't sure how I was going to feel about this. But I will say, again, 
a big piece of this was Austin, Texas. Look, Sting's yeah. music hits. Massive pop for Sting. And then a pretty good pop for Darby. And then incredible pop for the Hardy Boys music hitting. Uh, and then getting to do the entrance. You gotta get them some pyro, though. Like, honestly, yes. just give them the Butcher, ba- uh, uh, Butcher and Blades uh, pyro. Just give it to the Hardys. It's the same. Uh, but, <laughs> except just, like, aim it slightly different. But I felt like the crowd here really just brought this to life. They were ready for this the second it hit, and they were hot the entire time, just screaming at every single thing that was taking place. Uh Big Butch got to to show what he does best, throwing Darby down them stairs. Uh, he had, um, of course, right off the bat, Darby with the the dive on to his four opponents, but then Sting, uh, <laughs> never one to to not just be Sting. And look, Sting, my favorite wrestler ever. I grew up on Sting. Dude, Sting. Dude, like I thought we I thought we had too much in common, but that is that is me 100 percent Like <laughs> oh, we do true rewind on FIFA Overbook, and all you will see in the archives of True Rewind is from the start of the Monday Night Wars for anything Sting. Sting just has to do a stinger splash, and I give him the MVP of the show Sting. because I was I was a stinger from you know the blonde hair surfer Sting. Me, me rooting for him against the, the greatest monster hero. I ever saw Vader. I, I was scared of Vader as a kid. And I wanted to just defeat him all the time from there on on out to the, you know, the crow sting to I even liked Sting when he was against Terry from uh Terrence from Florida when he turned heel in 99. I was still on Sting's side. <laughs> so, <laughs> I'm with Sting always. I is it same. So uh pretty much the only time I like wasn't really into Sting was like TNA. But other than that, like yeah. um <laughs> But honestly, I I think Sting hadn't quite like figured out the nostalgia act he is today because for whatever reason, 13 years later, I should be more sick of Sting, but I'm like, no, give me all the Sting. Uh but so it it that I, I do think that's very funny. Uh because I was the same way. I used to collect um, WCW trading card packs, and I still have a lot of those cards. Uh, but like the more Sting cards I could get, the better. I was so into Sting as a kid. He was the best. Uh, and then, yeah, when he became the Crow, are you kidding me? Uh, it was just a perfectly timed thing. I uh, love Sting. And so getting to see more Sting is never a bad thing. And yeah, him doing that dive, I like he kind of was struggling to find his balance and i was like oh my god he's gonna fucking fall on his neck but uh he didn't he he hit it and it was perfect uh but then matt hardy got to show out matt hardy took the the side effect from private party off the stage uh back in the uh concession area we had uh butcher and blade laid out on uh, those two tables and Jeff Hardy got to have his first highlight reel moment in AEW already and he climbs the ladder and I'm wondering what's he gonna even do because the ladder is like not positioned well yeah. uh, and then he then goes away from the ladder onto the ledge of the, the window and then does a swanton off the window ledge on the butcher and the blade beautiful looking moment I loved it, uh, and crowd was screaming their heads off. They were so loud when that hit. And then we went back to the ring. Uh, as Private Party is bringing Matt Hardy into the ring, uh, and they brawl with Sting a bit. Sting uh, hits a couple of Stinger splashes, but then gets uh, put onto the turnbuckle as after uh, Mark Quinn moves out of the way of a Stinger splash, and it looks like they're about to hit Gin and Juice. Uh, but as Mark hits the, uh, I guess the Rana off of onto Sting, Sting jumps off, but then grabs Isaiah Cassidy and had this actually worked, it would have been smooth as fuck. (laughs) Right. But of course he, he lost his balance. Uh, and then 
kept holding on to to Isaiah Cassidy and like wouldn't let go, but trying to like stand back up. And it was like, just let him go and exactly. stand up and then pick him up for the Scorpion Death Drop. Matt Hardy, of course, the veteran he is, had the wherewithal to just like, okay, I'm standing here with Mark Quinn and I'm not just going to stand here and hold his head because that's going to look dumb. So he starts like punching Mark Quinn and I was like, okay, this 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 works. And then honestly, they got back up. They hit the duel, uh, Twist of Fate and Scorpion Death Drop, one, two, three. Baby faces win. AFO loses again. And this was a hoot, though. Uh, yeah, what did you think? This was an absolute blast. Like, I really legitimately, in 1997, believed Sting was Batman reborn in <laughs> professional wrestling. And he still is proving to be Batman because I just saw the Batman movie this week. And there's a whole scene where he just drops from a building and he has the suit on with the wings. That's Sting. Sting yeah. did it at Revolution. He went to a high spot and just dropped. And now he did it off the top ropes onto the whole AFO. Like, there was no better way to start off this match than Darby Allen with the best Tope Suicida. So, would you say, by the way, that Sting is like Batman Beyond at this point now? Like, yes. Is that, yes. Is that what he's, he is? He's 62 year old Bruce Wade. And he's, uh-huh. he, just, <laughs> he just comes out occasionally and just fights crime, fights off the AFO that's about getting money and stuff and destroys them it, it makes it makes sense and darby is his terry mcginnis look at this hey it works we we in there it's all it's all <laughs> works it all works this was great and it was just like t- this was two back-to-back matches that were awesome in two totally completely different ways you had a technical wrestling clinic with punk and dax harwood the bret hart special tribute match and then you had this one which was just wild and insane i felt like the revolution tornado tag was like the triangle ladder match from wrestlemania 20 and this was tlc2 this was just a step mm-hmm. above that one because you had Jeff jumping off a damn building ledge in his second match in AEW because he's Jeffrey Nero Hardy. And I had the honor to interview in one of his last interviews before he left WWE. And he said, he said he gave me three goals that he wanted. He wasn't able to do the first two because he was only there a month longer after I spoke to him. But his first two was getting a match with Roman Reigns for the Universal Championship. His uh, his second one was bringing Willow character to WWE. And then his third one was reuniting with Matt Hardy. And I quote, he said, either here or somewhere else, because this was a WWE press junket. So he, right. he kept it coy <laughs> on somewhere else. And I was just like, oh, I, I peep game. <laughs> game so so yes just seeing him able to do what he really wanted to do and he just seems very more happy more comfortable here just doing the insane stuff that we have grown in love about jeff hardy and this match was just a blast you had you had darby allen's kryptonite which is a flight of stairs him getting thrown (laughs) down in you had you had sting being batman you had the butcher being the butcher and i love the butcher he's probably my my favorite guy that's like the most underrated on this roster and you know blade just knows how to take these bumps and private party man i i've gotten to see them you know being here in new york got to see them starting out in hog in brooklyn when they were just starting out and i've actually talked to them personally before they got to hit aew it's just so awesome to see them where they're really just realizing their dream they're in there with the hardys with sting they're just having the time of their life they're they're losing all these matches but this is the best moment moments of their life if you know these guys you know that's a fact so i after the first 40 minutes of the show i was like i just saw cm punk jeff hardy and sting have great matches back to back what year is it like (laughs) i could double check yeah no honestly it ruled and i loved that uh in pretty much every single one of these scenarios uh somebody else got some shine and so i'm I, I I'm happy with this. And yeah, uh uh the N and the H uh says in the chat that private party uh, is loving every minute minute of this. Of course they are. Are you kidding me? Those guys are having the absolute time of their lives. Uh Ricardo the bad guy, by the way, says, uh, I need Andrade to go on a singles tear. Um we still haven't gotten the proper singles match with Darby yet. Like that's still on the table here. 
Yeah, uh, they. I think they announced it for next week at the end of the show. So, did they? Yeah, they announced that, and I, I believe the the FTR versus. Gun yeah, Club, I saw the FTR is, match. I didn't see yeah. the Darby versus Sting. Yeah, cool. yeah. Or Dar- um, Darby versus Sting. Darby versus Andrade. Cool. Yeah. Finally. Finally. Uh, yes. Yeah. <laughs> I was like, I'm uh, still, I'm still holding on to the beginning of this whole rivalry yeah. where Andrade doesn't understand the concept of friendship <laughs> and trying to buy Darby from Sting, and he doesn't even call him Sting. He says, uh, which, "Mr. Which, Sting, which, 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 which your boss, Mr. Stank, Mr. Yeah. Stank, Wait, where's your boss, Mr. Stink, Mr. Yeah. <laughs> How you know? How you know? <laughs> How you know? How you know? I love Andrade. He's the yeah, best. I, lo- I do. I love Andrade as well. Uh, oh, I. Thanks for reminding me. Didn't even grade either segment there. Uh, CM Punk versus Dax Harwood, solid A. Um, yes. And uh, Sting and Darby Allen uh, versus Sting, Darby Allen and the Hardys versus the AFO, A plus. I'm not going to quite um, S tier either of those, uh, but they're so close, and uh, I I had absolute fun with it. Um, so up next, we had a tag team matchup that saw the team of John Moxley and Brian Danielson take on the Varsity Blondes with Julia Hart. Of course, Moxley and Danielson accompanied by William Regal, his lordship. Uh, so Julia Hart is, of course, at ringside. Just... Not even paying attention to the match. She's actually looking elsewhere, not seeing this in any way, shape, or form. She's got the eye patch on. She's still very down, very depressed. If you saw uh, this week's edition of Dark, they played that up a little bit more with um, the Varsity Blondes kind of being um, almost just like jackass jocks and not paying attention to her at all. Uh, during their entrance, they took their jackets off and just threw them on her. And, uh, and so... And they're they're now in this mode of being kind of a little bit more obnoxious. They're very much teetering on turning them heel uh, if we're not already there. And so this match was basically just Moxley and Brian kicking the shit out of them. Uh, Somebody had even looped the the ending uh, strikes of Moxley um, hitting the elbows on Griff Garrison. Or was he? Yeah, I think he had Griff. And then uh brian stomping uh pillman's head in at the same time <laughs> and just that on loop uh one looks fucking amazing <laughs> but uh this match of course had regal on commentary regal is really good at this and he's been providing some great insight and just little things like uh he was asked about his relationship with brian pillman senior and uh he talked about how he was a great friend but an even greater foe. And I thought, damn, that Regal, so good. He's so good. Uh, but yeah, wasn't much to this match other than to continue to remind us that Moxley and Brian Danielson kick ass. Danielson's got a new shirt, by the way, that literally just reads violence. And uh, nice. I am in on that shirt. Uh, <laughs> I was hoping that's what they'd call the group, honestly, because I just thought about the fact that Moxley is, of course, known for unscripted violence. Brian Danielson is now just known for violence. Fuck it. Violence. That's what these guys do. They are just violent dudes. Uh, But a lot of people had kind of been noting that they felt like Moxley was kind of in the background of all of this. So let's address that. Moxley grabs the mic, and he... Let's us all know what the deal is with him and Brian and that the only person whose opinion that Moxley um, truly respects and he truly wants to hear from is William Regal and uh, that he wears that Blackpool badge of honor. What did they end up calling the group? The Blackpool Combat Club. Aha. BCC. Hmm. It'll grow on me, I'm sure. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> I would have been okay with just uh, violence. Did I just hear two year olds in the background? I think. Oh I yeah. Oh yeah. 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 My, I, I I already hear my wife going through it with my daughter right now in the background. <laughs> <laughs> hey, like I said, mine are 
uh let's see my son's hanging out after school right now because my daughter's got choir and i'm not going to make two trips so he has to hang out at the school while she's in choir and then i will pick up both of them when choir's over whatever i'm sure my son hates that but i'm not making two trips that is that is the dad life one day i will just do the the dad lessons of of will washington (laughs) Here. You just gave me my, my, my first lesson. I appreciate it. it went, yeah, went, if, my, daughter, my daughter's probably going to do like uh, cheerleading or gymnastics. I'm going to tell my son, you better get on the sports team and because I'm not making two trips. Yeah. Well, it's funny is my son is in, he's got robotics club on Tuesdays and it's the same deal where my daughter just has to hang out at the school till robotics club is over. Uh, they have a competition this weekend. Oh, crap. Nice. I got to talk to Reg and Phil about <laughs> <laughs> You're hearing it live here on on Fightful Overbooked on Day After Dynamite that uh, I have to do some shifting of Grap City's time start because my son has a robotics competition this Saturday. Uh, And he's already built like this really awesome Lego bot. It's really cool. Um, Anyway, yeah, this was, I mean, there wasn't much to this. uh, So this this earns a solid C plus for me. What'd you think of it? I would go as high as B minus for this one because I just love Moxley and Danielson together. Like mm-hmm. Brian Danielson has been my I, I I like I love Sting. I I I was a big Shawn Michaels fan when I was a kid. Like I said, my my mom used to tell me The Rock was my stepdad, and that my stepdad that was living with us was just there because The Rock had to travel across the world. So The Rock is also in my tier. But Brian Danielson is the only wrestler I could say I saw in a in a a busted down uh, building in New York city before he became a star and got to see him get to the heights in WWE. And now what he's doing in AEW is just amazing. So I just love Brian Danielson. Cause I have that connection with them from seeing him when I, I was ruined against him at my first independent show, which was ring of honor final battle 2006 only because homicide is my New York brethren. So I was cheering for him. But when I saw Brian Danielson, I was just like, this guy is just magic in the ring. He's just so smooth. Everything he does is just so perfect. It's just perfection. That's why I love Brian Daniels. I mean, uh, Moxley and Regal calling him the perfect wrestler because that's what Brian Danielson is. And just Moxley, I've always just loved from hearing him in like Dragon Gate USA with all the promos. I was like, who is this guy? Like he's talking like he's Brian Pillman S. Like just I had that vibe with him from the original time i heard him and then you know i was still with him throughout the wwe run even when it got bad but seeing him in aew in his bag being what he was meant to always be and now with regal who i've loved since he was lord single uh steven regal with jeevis in his corner at wcw i just love these three together so anytime they can just be dominant on anyone i enjoy it and then the promo by moxley was fantastic and I'm with you on the Blackpool Combat Club. I have to get used to it, but it just sounds badassery. So I'm I'm, yeah. I'm gonna go along with the ride. I'm hoping, by the way, that uh, I looked it up just to find it. Um, but I am truly, truly hoping that AEW secures uh, Regal's WCW music. Um, I think it's licensed <laughs> yes. through. Um, uh, I want to say associated production music, so it wouldn't be that hard to get your hands on. But uh, if they can get their hands on Regal's WCW music, I'd the Lord Steven Regal music, I would too. The moment that hits, would love it. Uh, that's what I'm hoping we get to hear. Uh, but I'm with you, by the way. Brian is like, if you ask me who the goat is in terms, like I think best in the business today. Brian is my yeah. favorite wrestler period like sting i've got my sentimental attachment to because i was a kid growing up with sting but like favorite wrestler guy i've enjoyed watching there's nobody i've enjoyed watching more than brian danielson uh and uh, somebody new would have to come along for that to change because nobody now is on his level to me uh so next segment we had mjf (laughs) so I have to hand some props to AEW for at least uh, trying to be consistent now because uh, I I don't know who had the bright idea, but somebody 
realized that based on the way the story is told, Wardlow shouldn't be listed on the AEW roster. So he's not anymore. They did remove him today from the AEW roster. Because really, the big payoff to this angle has to be Tony Khan tweeting that that Wardlow is all elite when he gets the graphic. Because that graphic never happened. Uh, When Wardlow debuted, there was no Wardlow is all elite graphic. So when that happens it's it's weird but that would be the payoff here so mjf and sean spears are out here to basically address what happened and uh and him oh mjf i do have to note also reminded us that he does he has not done with cm punk so i did want to hear what your thoughts were on that mr uh because that's the other thing. For those of you who really don't know SP3 like that, expert fantasy booker over here. <laughs> and so, <laughs> like, one of the best, honestly. Thank you. Thank and, you. and so, uh, I am curious what your thoughts are on MJF and CM Punk. And and you just reminded me of the first time we were on camera together. I legitimately (laughs) said CM Punk winning the AEW World Championship (laughs) at All Out in Chicago against MJF. So (laughs) now I have to reverse that because of what he he said in this promo. He said that he was going to deliver the most embarrassing loss of CM Punk's career. So He did say that. What's more embarrassing than losing in your hometown in the main event of a pay-per-view for the first time? That would be the first time that a heel really ends off a pay-per-view in AEW. What would make that worse? CM Punk wins the AEW World Championship at Double or Nothing and only holds it to the next pay-per-view, making him the shortest ever AEW World Champion so MJF beats him in his hometown. He can walk around with, I am 3-0 and against CM Punk in Chicago, and I am the new AEW world champion. That's what I think he is teasing. <laughs> Shit. That's really good. That's really <laughs> freaking good. And because, like, I've been of this mindset that uh, they've already proven they can do it. Pay-per-views usually do really well for AEW. I think they should do United Center for All Out this year. I, I'm I'm totally there with you. Someone said it in the live chat on True Hill Heat, and I was like, yeah, like you just sold out 13,000 in Las Vegas. You can't go back to Now Arena. I was there at the at All In, probably the, the most emotion that I got at a live event ever, just knowing how much, do you know, the elite kind of built to that event. So I understand the sentiment with the original Sears Center, now Now Arena, but you've outgrown it. You need to go to the United Center. And then add, add the cherry on top of my booking. You beat CM Punk in the building he returned in. <laughs> that would be... Damn. I am sold on this idea. Hella sold. Because uh, I, I, I will say that, um, you know, I've been to the Now Arena a few times now for... Um, I didn't go to All In, but I went to the two All Outs there. And I feel like... It's a good arena, but yeah. to be honest, as far as like Dynamite's concerned, I do think Wintrust is a better arena. Uh, and then for the pay-per-views, United Center, man. It's a great... Yeah. I mean, that's a historic venue. It's literally the largest arena in America. Uh, and it, so it is a flex to be able to say that you're running that venue, uh, especially for pay-per-view. Um, but this segment here saw MJF address CM Punk and say that, you know, he's not done with him. So we are going to head back there. The question is when. So my thought was that we were probably going to head back there maybe sooner than that. Because uh, my thought was May 11th, AEW is going to be in Long Island, on Long Island. Mm. Um, and so I thought, well, we've seen CM Punk versus MJF in chicago That's we true. then saw it in uh i guess neutral territory in, in orlando so what would be the last place to do that on mjf's turf in that is uh, true that is uh, true that's a good idea too <laughs> so i thought what if you know we 
this is uh, MJF's move is to challenge CM Punk this time in his hometown in front of his fans uh, where CM Punk walks in as the the enemy. And so uh I don't know. That's I like it. Uh, <laughs> I like it. I, I I wouldn't be mad at that either. <laughs> I figure you would have to make that trek for that one. That one yeah, I I, I, I I didn't for the first one, and I actually got offered like free tickets for it. But I was like, I I live in, I live in like I have a place in Harlem. I, mm-hmm. I I was living in the Bronx at the time. That's a long that's a long trip to get on the the L I double R during a pandemic to all the way to to Long Island. But for that, for C M Punk versus M J F, this this is probably my favorite feud in AEW. I don't think it's the best yet. I think if they run it back the way I did with All Out at All Out, mm-hmm. that would put the cherry on top and make that ahead of Hangman and Kenny Omega, which I have. At that's top. a hard one to top, though. That's, exactly. That's exactly. a really hard one to top. That one, I was emotionally invested in that, but I've been yeah. emotionally invested, too. Uh, but really, the the investment here is about Wardlow. And, of course, Wardlow makes his way out and is stopped by security. And MJF tells Wardlow that he is just going to pay him to sit at home. And that's exactly what you're going to do. You're going to go home. And uh, because he's not going to release him from his contract, he's going to keep him. And this is what we're doing here. So this story continues. People are really into Wardlow, though. Uh, And so... This is still working. It's still clicking. MJF is still the the strongest thing on the show. Uh, And I have no complaints about that. Uh, Shout out to Van Twinblade, by the way. Always giving us the indie updates. Uh, Sad news. Deanna Perrazzo isn't going to be at STL versus the world. Um, I'm curious what Deanna's doing, like, period. Like, you know, she's working the the Impact show, of course, um, on Friday, uh, WrestleMania weekend. But she's also... The Ring of Honor uh, Women's Champion, yeah, which is also happening Friday. I think they have like a two-hour difference. That's why I'm like telling a lot of people you may want to start. You want to watch the beginning of ROH Supercard of Honor because I think they're going to kick off with the Briscoes versus FTR because the Briscoes are on that Impact show against the Good Brothers, so they have to do the ROH show first and then make their way to wherever you know if there's a distance between them or and then the, the, what time. we're talking. One's in Garland, Texas. The other's in uh, proper Dallas. Uh, I don't know. I'm only going to try to make like I, I'm going to be at WrestleCon, but I will not be at uh, uh, the Impact show. I will be making my way to Ring of Honor, Super Card of Honor. Uh, Got to support my people because Swerve's on the card and the homie Denise also going to be yes. there. So uh, I definitely want to see all of that. Hey, so we had a really cool backstage segment here. Uh, the best friends were being addressed and I love I've always loved the idea that Wheeler was brought in while Trent was hurt. And Trent returning has never really had any fondness for Wheeler Yuta. Um, They've further elaborated on this, on being the elite. If you follow any of that, uh, (laughs) literally Trent showed off his gear, uh, which it had little symbols for every member of Best Friends. And it had a little alien for Chris Statlander. And it had the, I think it was the glasses for um for orange cassidy and then it had literally a poop emoji and he said you know what that is that's a piece of shit for wheeler (laughs) yuda trent has just never been a fan of wheeler yuda's i think that's actually because even if um you don't follow any of that and you're just watching the show he's just always been kind of apprehensive toward him he hasn't been yeah uh he, he hasn't wanted to be a part of uh, or wanted Wheeler to be a part of any of that. And Wheeler addressed that. Wheeler's like, look, I'm not here to be the best friend I can be. I'm here to be the best wrestler I can be. And so Trent told him, we're done with you. And so Wheeler's out of best friends. And he wants, he sounds like he wants to join the Blackpool uh, Combat Club. So you can do a little, you know, maybe multi man matches with that. But I think definitely, I think Wheeler Yuta versus Trent. 
this that that will be a big time matchup for Willie Yuta's future. I think it would be great if they did that on a dynamite or a rampage and had Regal on commentary, maybe Brian and and uh and Mox at ringside just to like kind of further scout Willie Yuta because they seemed like they that's gonna be the first guy that they put under the wing of these three guys. Absolutely. Yeah. I uh I, I think that's exactly where this should go, and I'm uh, really excited to see what goes down with these uh, with these two. I want to see Wheeler Yuta versus um, Trent like soon. Like, just jump on that. We, it it has to happen as a match. I'm ready for it. And I think Dynamite's probably the place for that. Uh, I also think that if you give Yuta the win there, you can like immediately go into, you know what? He's earned his spot. Uh, Wheeler Yuta is now all elite. Like, I don't know. There's stuff you can do with that. Yeah. And, yeah. Uh, I, I forgot. We never got that, that he's all elite yet. So, yeah. He's yeah, not all true. elite. He's not all elite yet. So <laughs> that's, that's <laughs> the point where they can make that happen. Uh, so like I said, there's, there's stuff you can do there. And so next up we had, uh the number three ranked jay lethal and a lot of uh people were asking huh okay (laughs) uh (laughs) taking on adam cole uh a renewal of their rivalry uh from very uh i I wasn't gonna say early i wanted to say early but no that's not early at all (laughs) um but six years ago in ring of honor these two uh had beef uh, Jay Lethal actually had his head shaved by the super click, and like, why wasn't that mentioned? Like, Excalibur gave us like <laughs> they burst in the Ring of Honor Championship tournament. Uh, mm-hmm. Cole beat him for his second championship. He's the one that he turned and joined the Young Bucks and the Bullet Club and the Elite on Jay Lethal. But he didn't mention the biggest one, which was the the signature braids of Jay Lethal who were shaved off. The Bow Wow braids, as I, yeah. I like to call them. The Bow Wow braids that Lethal used to have was shaved off by Adam Cole. I was like, Excalibur, come on, man. And then yeah, he said that, death, your... death by dishonor instead of mm-hmm. death before dishonor, which that was a pet peeve as well. Yes. <laughs> Especially because... Look, Ring of Honor's in the family now. It's not one of those things where, like, you have to loosely address their history. No, you have their history. Just do it all. Just talk about it all. It happened. Uh, But, yeah, we saw Jay Lethal take on Adam Cole. um, And, you know, presenting Jay Lethal as number three ranked in this case meant that Jay Lethal was going to have a a solid showing um, because this wasn't just an exhibition match in this case for Adam Cole. This was... Adam Cole versus somebody who's top ranked. And so in this case, Jay Lethal really came out swinging and we had ourselves a really competitive match, a match that at one point it almost felt like Jay Lethal had won. Uh, But yeah, we saw a really back and forth competition between these two. Uh, Some really fun reversals. I thought the reversal of the, the first initial reversal of the um, lethal injection was really good. Uh, some near falls uh, because people keep falling for the Panama Sunrise as a finish, even though he doesn't win with that. Um, <laughs> but but people fall for it, uh, and we do we do at one point see Red Dragon make their way down to uh, attempt to uh, help Cole get the victory. Um, the finish ends up being. Uh, another attempt at the lethal injection, but this time a low blow hit by Adam Cole. Uh, and then he hits him with the boom. One, two, three. Adam Cole is your victor. And uh, Adam Cole gets on the mic, says that he is the rightful AEW world champion. Out comes Adam Page, who starts whipping their asses, literally, uh, as he pulls his belt off. Uh, starts going to town on all three of them. But they, the numbers game gets the best of Adam Page, then outruns Jurassic Express. But Adam Cole, in the process of them escaping, steals the AEW World Championship. Interesting. Very, Interesting. Like, very, the, very. So, I'm wondering where this is headed. I have a couple of ideas. So, my first thought is... Just do Adam Cole versus Adam Page. 
one on one at uh, Battle of the Belts rematch. But then I saw somebody pitch the idea of a winner take all six man match. And I thought, mm. oh, that would be fun too. Uh, because we are obviously also going with Red Dragon versus Jurassic Express for the tag titles. What if you went winner take all? Ooh, that would be very, very interesting. And I, I, I would love that because that match last week was an absolute banger to open the show. I was all my I was I was getting off of my, my couch watching that match last week. So I'd be down for a rematch winner takes all. But I think that the hangman page taking off the belt meant something. And maybe they might do a strap match, which I'd be all the way down for my myself there too. I like Adam Cole's uh, promo. The one one part that you missed was him saying, "Hangman Page is a coward. He's not man enough to come out and stand toe to toe with all three of us." <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that was a great line. <laughs> That's great. I, I love thought... that. This is such a great line. I agree. That was so good. <laughs> I just love how they are actively through his like promo work and through the finishes of his matches. They are actively trying to get this crowd that loves Adam Cole during his entrance to boo him, to get heat on Adam Cole. And that was something that always was a thing that I nitpicked about his NXT run is that they made him kind of overpower a lot of people. He didn't need Undisputed Era to beat the Johnny Garganos of the world or the, or the Velveteen Dreams of the world. He just beat them. He just beat them. It was like, how are we? Why are we supposed to boo this guy? Why is this guy the top heel when he's beating everybody pretty much on his own, even though he has a stable? But here in AEW, he uses low blows. He uses distraction from Red Dragon. I like that they are kind of going in that, yes, he is a heel. And they've still given him a direction throughout all of this, which I enjoy because the one pet peeve that I have with like, title contenders in general in AEW you you get build up for your title match you use you lose your title match and then you kind of seem directly directionless for a while but Adam Cole has stayed on the same path he wants the AEW world championship I like that they're going back to this match because it did deliver at Revolution but I do agree with you they need a hook to it whether it's the strap match whether it's a trios winner takes all they need something and I would also talking about the tag team titles I would want Red Dragon to win the tag team titles in a two-on-two match because I don't know if anybody realizes, but this week on Rampage is going to be their first official real two-on-two tag team match in AEW, even though they've been here for three months. Yep, I I noted that going into Revolution that somehow, some way, their Revolution tag match was the first time they had competed as a tag team, and it was for the tag titles. So, yeah, and now their first proper two-on-two is happening this Friday on Rampage. Fun. Uh, yeah, <laughs> like, so, these are the facts, but... So, I, I actually did enjoy the segment, though, and I'm glad, glad everything's continuing. This is a... a and I don't mean this negatively. It's a B minus for me. I had fun with pretty much the match and then the uh, the aftermath. Um, I'm actually very okay with uh, this feud continuing and I want to see what they do end up announcing um, as far as how Adam Cole gets his next title shot. So, we have to talk about where the show uh, takes a dive for some people. Uh, (laughs) So, Sammy Guevara in the ring. I'll be a tad more positive about this than most. I thought Sammy to start here was fine. Yes. Completely inoffensive. I thought that uh, he talked about, um, you know, he mentioned the style he works is probably going to shorten his career, but he doesn't care because uh, he's going to live for the moment and these fans uh, do the things for him and it gets them off their, or gets them, uh, on their seats and and off off their feet on their feet on their feet to say and chanting holy shit and uh, that's what keeps him going and that's what's going to continue to motivate him. I thought all that was fine. I've seen people dogging on that. I thought that for the most part, you know, Sammy did pretty prototypical babyface stuff yeah. that you would expect to see from somebody like Sammy. Wasn't offensive at all. 
Uh, and then Ty Conti. Uh, uh, um, I, I would say like that it starts to kind of mm-hmm. take a little bit of a dive. Even still, wasn't terribly offended by Ty Conti here. And then uh, Men of the Year and Dan Lambert make their way to the ring or to the top of the stage. Again, on the positive side, when Dan Lambert doesn't have to go for low hanging fruit, it's not that bad. No. And like, Lucha Horace is like really low hanging fruit and totally unnecessary. It is. I didn't think he was terrible here until like that. And then it was just like, what? Do we... And unfortunately, that was pretty early on. Uh, and it's like, you know, the rest of the material isn't so bad. But also, like, did you watch the um, the AEW Awards? I watched a little bit of it. I saw Kenny's acceptance speech. I saw, like, stuff with Hook. That's about it. I didn't watch the whole thing. So I watched the whole thing. And I forget. Men of the Year on their own are really charismatic guys who talk well, who are funny, who play well off of each other, who really just need themselves. And I was enjoying a lot of that uh, watching the AEW Awards. Scorpio Sky is charismatic. They were having a good time. They were being fun. They were being heels, though. They were talking about the awards they didn't win. Why weren't they nominated um, and all that stuff? And it was like, no, they're good at this. Just let them be them. What the hell do they need Dan Lambert for at all? Dude, between this and we're, we're, we're I, I'm gonna bring the fury. I'm just warning anybody watching and you <laughs> when we talk about the 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 other woman segment on this show uh, that was a talkie segment. I'm gonna bring some fury, but this it, it was two segments where I was just like, what is the point of these managers? Like Ethan Page is a great talker. He proved that in Impact Wrestling, and he's proved that anytime you gave him the stick in AEW. And Scorpio Sky is very charismatic. He can talk well. They, the men of the year, do not need Dan Lambert. I'm sure there are other guys on this roster that needs a Dan Lambert, but they are not two of them. Agreed. <laughs> and yeah, uh, and then in the cringeworthy moment of the segment, but hey, it got a pop. So we saw uh, Dan Lambert kiss the belt. Sammy Guevara says, you know, we obviously live rent-free in your head, but if you knew what we did with that belt on, we now live rent-free in your mouth as well. That got a reaction. I wish they had just left it there, because then they had to fucking tweet out the picture. Um, and... And then it's just like, the these... Why do you two insist on making yourselves completely unlikable? <laughs> it's like Cody and Brandy left, and they was like, we really need to fill this spot of two people that are have the guise of they're supposed to be baby faces, but we're going to put them against Dan Lambert, and Dan Lambert comes out of it looking like more of the baby face over these two people. It seems like they did that with Cody Cody and Brandy, and they did that here. I totally agree with everything you said. Like, Ty came off well. I like her mentioning, uh, I'm going to I'm gonna kick Paige Van Zandt's ass like she got her ass kicked throughout her entire fighting career. I love that line. Mm-hmm. Um, Dan Lambert just... Yeah, he just tries to be like he's in the Attitude Era, and he's like he's like Jim Cornette of now in the Attitude Era. That's basically right. Dan Lambert's character, and I'm just like, no, no, not as much camera time and not as much mic time as this guy gets. Like, I, I'm just over it. I'm mad at myself that the first time Lambert was on this show, I actually enjoyed it because it was something new. It was something different. And you can you can get you. You're OK with it in a in a vacuum. But ever since they've made him an ongoing character, it's been a law of diminishing returns. Well, the problem is they've lost sight of what made the first segment good. The first segment was that he was he didn't do any of the the, I guess, 
chauvinistic stuff that he does now. The original segment was just him dogging on AEW. It was him being yeah. the anti-AEW guy and positioning himself against the fans. I don't know where all this other shit has come from. Like, why we've decided he also needs to be there. Because that's what made Dan Lambert work. This, on the other hand... <sighs> D. Not going to go D minus because there's a scale here. And if I have to go even lower on another segment, then this one gets a D. Oh, yeah. Uh, yeah. Yeah. D's, D's fair because, yeah, this ain't <laughs> the lowest segment of the night. Like, there there was effort here to try to make this entertaining. And it, like you said, it got a response from the fans. So D sounds reasonable. Yeah. Um, we did get a video promo, though. My family, Shane Strickland, is challenging uh, Ricky Starks for the FTW title in the main event of Rampage this week. Pfft, you'll never take that from me. That shit is awesome. Um, and, yeah, it's it's a it's a good time. It's a good time to be in the Washington Strickland family. Uh, and it's, it's so funny because um, I was just talking to him the other day because... I get random friend requests from people with the last name Strickland um, because I, I've come to assume that if somebody has the last name Strickland, they're probably related to my dad in some way. And, uh, and so usually if I don't see they have a mutual friend between me and Shane, then I'll usually like best them. I'm like, hey, do you know this person? And, <laughs> <laughs> and somebody just added me and then... Uh, uh, they they messaged me. They were like, "Hey, I'm your third cousin." I'm like, "Okay, that's cool." Um, so that's that's my household, and it's uh, that's my family, and that's that is what it is. Uh, and it's so funny because uh, growing up, um, and I think it's on Swerve's Wikipedia page. For those who don't know this, we have a cousin who played for the Dallas Cowboys, Fred Strickland, um, in the wow. '90s, uh, and uh, there's. Not much more to it than that. Shane Strickland. I'll never have anything negative to say. I can't. There's, there's nothing more I want than to see that man succeed as a star in pro wrestling. And he's in AEW now. But before we got there, Layla Hirsch, in a rematch from last week's Rampage, took on Red Velvet. I don't know. Kind of, it, it was. <laughs> yeah, yeah. You know, it, these are two people that are two individuals that are not that experienced. So I, I think like the flow of the match wasn't really there. I like both of them individually. I feel like Red Velvet has a great deal of potential, and that's the person I really want to be thrown uh, eventually after like a year undefeated streak of Jade Cargill. I think the whole story of how her and Red Velvet have kind of been at each other's necks ever since Jade has debuted, I think would be a cool story. The underdog eventually beating her for the TBS champion. I see the potential in Red Velvet, but this match wasn't, it didn't work. Um, I didn't hate this match. Uh, I like, I actually like the Rampage match better. Um, but yeah. I don't know. I didn't really hate this. Uh, and I actually do like the story of Layla Hirsch basically kind of finding, I don't know, uh, the turnbuckle is in itself kind of a unique weapon. And so yeah. I kind of like that she's introduced that into the fold. Um, and yeah, that's, that's as, as much good as I can say here. Chris Statlander um, also, like I said, we have a program happening here. And so I, I will always support there being more women's wrestling and there being more of a women's program. And so I was fine with pretty much everything that took place here. Uh, and continuing to see more and more happen for them. Jade Cargill also had a promo after the fact. And Jade Cargill, I'm starting to wonder if she's not going to get that 30th win. Because the way they keep every promo she's been cutting has been basically talking about it as if it's a foregone conclusion. And I can't help but wonder if this is where the streak ends. That she makes it to 29-1 and one because... You know, she this time she was talking about what the celebration is going to have for her 30th win that she's going to have uh, this year and that. And she wanted to have uh, 
she wanted to have dancers and she's just talking about the celebration party and uh, she wants lots of green yeah she said exotic dancers and I can't help but wonder uh, and hold on shout out to Kurt Benoit in the uh, uh, with the super chat says Saul Swerve in Dublin about two weeks ago uh, right before his music kicked in I shout it's Will Washington's cousin <laughs> one person in about a 700 crowd uh, 700 person crowd shouted Grap City bitches back at me that's, that's awesome, awesome. <laughs> that's so awesome <laughs> I love that. Thank you. That's the best thing I've ever heard. Um, so, uh, but yeah, I can't help but wonder if they're setting Jade up to lose because the more she keeps talking about this 30th win that is like a, a foregone conclusion, the more I think that she's not going to get it. So, you might be on to something because I keep hearing people talk about like they might bring in a certain Athena to be that 30th opponent and I wouldn't mind them kind of strapping the rocket to her in her first win beating the undefeated uh, Jade Cargo would set her up on a nice little path but I just need Athena in this company because her and Thunder Rosa had one of my favorite independent matches of this year that 30 minute time limit draw for Warrior Wrestling and I need to see that they've been they've been stealing a lot of ideas from warrior wrestling on, on the low I, I i i peep game because they they stole the whole idea from mercedes martinez and thunder rosa from warrior wrestling so steal that one as well because athena and thunder rosa they got some chemistry yes i would love to see that speaking of thunder rosa so it's time for the celebration we get to hear in Texas from the AEW Women's World Champion. Her music hits. She's got cool new graphics. She finally has a new Tron. Um, her entrance videos had footage from freelance wrestling since she debuted back before All Out 2020. So she finally has a new Tron. It's got new graphics. It's got the belt in it. And uh, Tony Schiavone brings her out. And I'm like, all right, she's going to get to speak in front of her Texas crowd. She was just talking about the Eddie and Brock feud. So, like, this is a perfect way to the thing to kind of reference. You can do the confetti. Like, this is going to be awesome. This is going to be amazing. Um, this is the perfect place. You, uh, last week, uh, I, I can stop being sarcastic now because you know what the fuck happened here. So, <laughs> uh, Thunder Rosa. <sighs> she starts to talk. Before she can even get any words out, she's interrupted by Vicky Guerrero. Vicky Guerrero, just excuse me, excuse me's all over anything she has to say. Talks about she's not even really from Texas, that uh, she's got her green card. Thunder Rosa tries to fire back, says, I'm, I actually became a U.S. citizen here in the state of Texas. Vicky just cuts her off again. And then out comes Nyla Rose to ambush her. End segment. Uh, this sucks for a number of reasons. One. The appeal of Vicky Guerrero in 2008 and on was that Vicky was actually bad and everybody was in on the joke, but I never really felt like Vicky was ever good. Um, and I love Vicky Guerrero, uh, but that was part of it. Like, yeah. it was like, Hey, Vicky sucks. And, uh, this is why, <laughs> and it's like, okay, we're all in on this. She, yeah, she doesn't really talk well at all. She's screechy. She's annoying. Um, there's not really any redeeming qualities. Uh, when you think about what professional wrestling managers bring to the table, she doesn't have any of them. And that's why this works. That was also like 14, 15 years ago. We're way past that shit now. Way past the need for Vicky Guerrero. Uh, and it's at the point where you talk about uh, one of the best episodes of Dynamite, that February 20th or 19th edition, 2020, uh, that saw the steel cage match that had that tag title match. It also had a really good battle royal on it. Another thing from that match, which I tweeted, was the fact that Nyla Rose, the week after she won the title, cut a really good promo. Ended with the phrase, nobody is a beast like me. Love that line. 
great. She's always great on the mic. She's charismatic yeah. as hell. She has never needed Vicky Guerrero. You could have gotten here. I'm not even down on the idea because I know a lot of people are down on the idea of Nyla being the first challenger again because she was Britt's first challenger. I'm actually okay with that because I like Nyla Rose in the ring. I think the biggest issue here was going places you didn't have to go. Vicky Guerrero did not need to be here. You definitely should have let Thunder Rosa get some words in. And on top of all of that, you went you went with the racism. And the problem is, if you've ever heard Vicky Guerrero, that's stuff she actually believes. Um, that's the kind of shit she actually talks. She's a big supporter of the wall. So, like, it also stings in that direction, too. This was real bad. SP3, I'm going to give you the floor on this one. Literally, last week, I said Thunder Rose's title win on AEW Dynamite, St. Patrick's Day Slam, for me as a fan, was one of my all-time favorite moments because Thunder Rosa is somebody that I very much call my favorite wrestler in the world, not just because I think she's amazing in the ring, has an amazing character, amazing look, presentation, aura, everything about her just works, is someone that took the time out and gave me one of my first interviews back in 2019. She also is someone that True Hill Heat has sponsored Mission Pro Wrestling and what she did for women's wrestling at a time that they really needed during the speaking out movement. I don't think a lot of people pay attention or praise her on the fact of being an entrepreneur with that. So all of that being said, I said that as a fan, one of my all-time moments is seeing her win the AEW Women's World Championship. It's up there with like, in, my daughter. In the main event at that. Yes. In the main event, it's up there with Brian Danielson winning the WWE title at WrestleMania 30 for me. It's up there with Kenny Omega winning the IWGP Heavyweight Championship for me. It's up there with The Rock, as I said earlier, my stepdad winning, uh, beating Triple H at Backlash 2000. And that crowd reaction for me as a wrestling fan, those are my all-time favorite moments and championship wins. How dare you, Tony Khan and AEW, treat her like this on the first night of her as champion in Texas, mind you. She doesn't even get a sentence out. Doesn't even get a sentence out after she just did an interview with one of my other good friends, Steve Fall. See, my daughter is really upset about this. She's just going off in the background. I love Um, it. I I love it, by the way. So Steve Fall did a great interview with Thunder Rosa, where she brought up she felt a lot of disrespect and racism from Brock Lesnar doing the whole uh, making fun of the Mexican culture during the Eddie Guerrero feud. You then have Vicky Guerrero, someone who actually believes these things, talk about her not being a real Texan and having a green card. When Vicky, don't you know where the Guerrero family is from? The name that you've been, like, you've kind of put your career on. Don't you know that they are not from Texas either? Like, I'm I'm just like, you know, there was just a lot of tone deaf with this. But most of all, I wouldn't even say this entire segment was bad. It just felt rushed, lazy, no effort. My daughter is just, like, very upset about this in the background, too. So it just, like, it's, like, it's very embarrassing that this is what you do with Thunder Rose's first opportunity. You had one of your better champions with Britt Baker, but the main nitpick with that was the challenger of the month. You never really gave her a feud, and then when you got back to the feud, everybody was waiting for it. You didn't put a lot of effort to build up to that for a revolution because you had St. Patrick's Day Slam on the back burner in Thunder Rose's home town and it feels like all of that work that you did to build up the steel cage match is now hollow because of how you followed up this and i could have made this better in two seconds you don't put vicky and nyla there because literally nyla rose for everything i could say good about her she has one of the best twitter handles in all of professional wrestling she's so charismatic she doesn't need vicky she can cut a promo on her own she's fantastic and it makes sense for her to be a challenger for thunder rosa because she got a singles win over thunder rosa before she became champion All of that being said, Nala Rose has lost to every single AEW Women's World Champion in the company's history. 
in the company's history. Rio beat all her for the them. title. All of them, except for herself. That's the only person she couldn't lose to, and that's the only one she hasn't lost to. And now you're setting up her to lose to Thunder Rosa when all you had to do is continue the feud that you did last week by having Reba Rebel interrupt. Uh, uh, Thunder Rosa and say you didn't really beat Britt Baker last week and then have Jamie Hayter come in and attack Thunder Rosa and make her the first challenger that's at least a continuation of what you've already been building to so it, that would have made so much more sense than what they did I'm just embarrassed for AEW because I'm done with the excuses with this woman's division they need to put more effort in it and they just I just didn't see it here I will say, and thank you. I appreciate the the cameo from your daughter. Uh, like for real. I uh, are you kidding me? I I did a podcast a year ago with Jesse Davin, and she had a newborn with her, and literally the whole time, uh, and it was great. Are you kidding me? I have kids, and <laughs> I am. That's who I am. I get it. But a um, couple of things. First off, I want to read uh, super chat. I think um, she wants one. to formally say hi to. So <gasps> you want to say hi? Hi. <laughs> Let them know, Harlem. Say no. We don't. We don't like that booking. You got to treat Thunder Rosa better, right? Exactly. <laughs> All right. Hi. All right. So, Van Twinblade says mandatory viewing when the VOD drops. Jake something versus Ethan Price from Glory Pro. Uh, good times. Uh, bad times. Um, and then also we got another. Uh, from Monique, who said, rushed, lazy, and no effort. Kind of describes the booking of the women's division for the most part. TK needs to do better. So, I'm going to back up here for a sec. Because I feel like if I use this as an indictment on the women's division as a whole, then uh, I feel like I'm not giving the credit to the shit I really like. Like Sheeta and, and, um, and Serena Deeb. Um, which I feel like Serena Deeb's come off very strong. I actually have liked the uh, what's been going on with Chris Statlander and Layla Hirsch. Um, I like the fact that I got three women's matches at Revolution. I like the fact that Jade Cargill has come off like a star. So what I am going to say here, though, is that um, I thought that they did gain so much goodwill in that main event last week and to come back here, lazy is the proper term here, mainly because this is like this is what I mean when I say this. So a shock here said is the AEW women's division dead to everyone. See, that's not the shit I want to say here, because, again, no, I just brought up multiple things in the division that I'm a really big fan of. Yes. Um, and so, no, that's not what I'm going to say. I'm going to say that this was lazy. And it was lazy because this is exactly what we did last year when Britt won the title and we went straight to Nyla Rose. And, uh, and, and it that wasn't the move to do because you had to fight against Britt being a baby face, getting cheered and having her go against a heel. It that I, I've been criticizing that move. I was like, this was the perfect role. Even if she was on her way out of the company, Big Swole beat Britt Baker in a major feud in the tooth and nail match, the feud that really got Britt over the perfect first contender for her was, was big swole. If it wasn't big swole, you put in red velvet, you put in a bait, you put in a baby face that the fans can get behind against Britt. And I feel like then I would be okay with Nyla Rose being the first challenger here, but because you just did that with Britt now, this does, it just feels like retread. Yeah, it's definitely retread. And like, no matter what this segment like fails this is an f um easy f that said um can the angle win with me really only one way that can happen if i can put my fantasy booking cap on which is that uh <laughs> vicky guerrero uh accompanies nyla rose to the ring we get nyla rose versus Thunder Rosa, AEW Women's World Title on the line. I don't know. We do this next week on Rampage. After the match is over, Vicky Guerrero power bombs 
or gets power bombed by Nyla Rose and we never see Vicky Guerrero again. That's my fantasy booking and we're done with that. Um, because that's honestly my biggest True. problem here. I yes. can I can live with Thunder Rosa facing off with Nyla Rose. Recognize I mean, I recognize Nyla Rose, perennial loser. She's basically like the Dolph Ziggler of this division. Continually gets the challenge, never really wins. Uh, unless Nyla Rose, I guess, goes to Ring of Honor and wins, then I she's was, also Dolph Ziggler. I was um, going to say she's the Lance Archer of the women's division. Yeah. Um, <laughs> and so, but even Lance Archer got to win the the yeah. IWGP title. That's true. Um, and so, yeah, somebody also asked in the chat. They said, uh, uh, "What was the question?" He said, "Where is Shida? Where is Deeb? Where is Ruby? Uh, Emmy, Riho, and Yuka already back in Japan. Where is everyone?" Shida was there last night. She uh, she did some pre tapes, uh, not pre tapes, I guess. She taped some stuff um, for the Deeb feud, and then also uh, I think she worked Elevation as well. Um, I'm pretty sure they're gonna. They still have to blow off that match. They're still two and two. And they've been yeah. cutting promos on each other. I think they're going to do some type of big match between Sheeta and Deep. Like I said, they've got the best stuff. Um, honestly, I think Sheeta versus Deep too is like up there as one of my all-time favorite women's matches. Um, and it's also one of the right. highest-rated women's matches on Cage Match of 2021, uh, which surprised me. Um, so again, I there's places that are working in the women's division. So I don't want to be one of those people who just kind of says that this whole thing uh, is an indictment of the entire division, but it is an indictment of booking the champion. And it is consistent with how the champion has been booked um, the last really two years. And so yeah. uh, I just, I want to see something more. And I do agree in the, uh, with a lot of people, there's a lot of names you could bring up here that I would like to see, like an Emmy Sakura. I would like to see, um, hell, uh, I, I feel like this is probably what uh, Layla Hirsch is building to, is some kind of title shot. Either way, this was such, such a bad segment. And there's so many little pieces here that could have saved it, such as just giving thunder rosa a minute to talk talk about how much the moment meant to her yeah just just but, give her opportunity to say a sentence at the very least but oh. everything you could have done wrong with this segment did get done wrong and that to me is one you don't get back because you're not going to be in texas next week uh next week you're in south carolina uh columbia so yeah, this one is a total loser to me. Yeah. And then finally, uh, in the main event, we had the Dark Order. Um, and I did like Excalibur noting how um, John Silver and Alex Reynolds have become the star members of the Dark Order, noting that it's kind of replaced Stu Grayson and Evil Uno uh, yeah. because these two got to face the Jericho Appreciation Society. John Silver, Alex Reynolds... Um, I didn't dislike any of this. I think people were only down on this because the previous segment pissed them off so much. Uh, but no, this was fine. Uh, I think John Silver uh, is fantastic, and he works a really great heart. Er, he works a really great hot tag. I think him and Alex Reynolds are actually a really solid team. Um, I think people probably also had an issue with this being the main event because nothing happened. I think that uh, had this ended with say a return of Santana and Ortiz and Eddie Kingston or something, people would have been more into this. But the yeah. fact that it just kind of happened, this is one of those matches that probably could have happened in the middle of the show and wouldn't have offended anybody. But because of where it happened, how it happened, and the fact that there was nothing afterward, uh, I think that's mostly what got people. Um, Chris Jericho faced... Uh, I mean, and they won. That was the other thing. And like I said, the match itself wasn't all that remarkable, other than the fact that it was a good match, and John Silver has a great comeback. Yeah, he, the best hot tag that I. It's very reminiscent to Cesaro in the bar. Just yes. how he just goes crazy on everybody, hitting moves all outside the ring, inside the ring, the big dive off the top ropes. It's very reminiscent. I love John Silver. I think him and Alex Reynolds are the star tag team of 
Dark Order. And I like Daniel Garcia getting a victory here in the main event using Red Death to get the submission win. So uh, all of this worked. I just think that if you swap this out with the Hardy, Sting, and Darby tornado Would've tag, way out. You, you would have had a night and day better show, honestly. Like the last 40 minutes is where like it kind of fell off. And then this match was good, but it just wasn't at the same level as those first two matches. Had this been good earlier in the show, I think, yeah, I agree. Maybe Everybody would remember it better and remember the second half, the second hour of the show, because the first hour was a 10 out of 10, honestly. Like there was just so much good going on in that first hour. It felt like they were on their way to an all-timer episode even into the second hour with lethal and cole and then just like i said they kind of veered left like there was stuff i liked about it like you know sammy's part of the promo ty's line in the promo nothing after that but uh then then it was stuff i liked with layla hirsch and red velvet nothing i liked with the thunder rosa segment and then this match was solid solidly worked but it just felt off you should have kind of finished with the tornado tag in my opinion oh, yeah i agree and i thought that's what they were going to do i was actually shocked that it was the second match on the show um so yeah i give this match a c plus uh it was fine it just wasn't something i would have made event it with uh and i think it almost did a disservice because um now granted twitter is vocal and not exactly uh not representative of everything, but I feel like Twitter was very like so angry about the previous segment that anything that followed that wasn't going to get uh, any praise. I like honestly, I think had that segment not happened or happened with just one element changed, any one of them, whether it had been um, Thunder Rosa just interacting with Nyla or Thunder Rosa getting to speak, anything you changed there probably would have changed anything that anybody felt about that segment but you did everything wrong with that and i think it brought this main event down uh overall i had fun with the show like like you mentioned an all-timer first hour and 20 but man uh where this show didn't work it didn't work uh and so that is all elite wrestling dynamite been sitting on this rating here for over an hour and so i am curious how it did um oh and we have quarters as well yes i I also love that so the overall rating uh we're up uh aew dynamite did uh 1 million 46 thousand viewers um that's actually a pretty huge uh 18 to 49 as well it did Mm a uh 0.41 um in 18 to 49 number three reading number yeah. three overall for no. cable originals and i think that's the the last episode that was highest was uh the one with page and archer in the mm-hmm. uh in the texas death match so very good yep. numbers overall yep and uh the the quarters i mean honestly the the lowest quarter is the main uh <laughs> was the main event did 919 actually um but everything else everything else on the show held over a million until that main event so uh i am curious to see how that uh and it's almost consistent across all demos that literally it was that last last segment some might say that the previous segment did put them (laughs) off who knows but either way or or just was it not a main event worthy segment who knows the main event was the only thing uh under the uh under a million wow and it's under a million by a lot like they had almost lost a hundred thousand people from the second to last quarter to the last uh, just a sign that yeah that it, it's not it's not some, always about some, the main event it's about the thing before the main event so hey something about the main event didn't hook people but everything else pretty much clicked uh matter of fact shout out to um Dax and Punk for keeping people the way they did out of Big Bang Theory because yeah. they did. People stuck around for that whole match. Uh, so big yeah. shout out on that. Uh, it's great stuff. So either way, that is Day After Dynamite. Man, SP3, the king of Fightful Overbooked. 
<laughs> no, don't give me, don't give me that. They <laughs> don't give me that crowd. I won't take <laughs> it. <laughs> we gotta have you back. This was fun. This has been Day After Dynamite. I am Will Washington for SP3. We'll see you next time. Have a great day. Peace.